Well, thank you very much for having me today. I'm very excited to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is post-traumatic headaches. Um, I'm a physiatrist. Uh, I also am, uh, I am the lead of the Calgary Brain Injury Program, so I see quite a few headache, pa uh, headache patients there in the post-concussion clinic, as well as in the Moderate Severe Traumatic Brain Injury Clinic, so I have the opportunity to see patients there, as well as at the Chronic Pain Center and the Post-Traumatic Headache Clinic. Uh, these are my disclosures and supports and, and financial interests. And I won't go through them all. Um, okay, so I'm going to start with concussion in general. So over 450,000 Canadians will sustain a concussion annually. That's a lot. And of these, up to 25% will have persistent symptoms beyond three months. The most common sy symptom is headache or post-traumatic headache. And up to 58% of these individuals will have persistent symptoms with a new different type of headache at one year post-injury, meaning that they, their headache profile or phenotype has changed following the injury. Oops. Oh, doesn't like that slide. Um, so, how do we define post-traumatic headache? Well, we define acute headache, which is attributed to a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion, as a headache that occurs within seven days of a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion. And then we define a post-traumatic headache that is chronic in nature, one that persists at three months or greater. So, what do we know about post-traumatic headaches? Well, 80% of individuals who will sustain an acute post-traumatic headache will get better. They feel better. They might have a change in their phenotype of the headache, but they do get better. And over time, as people recover from their concussion or mild traumatic brain injury, the headache profiles often improve. But as you can see here from this literature, even at one year, there's a large range of those who will have a chronic or meet criteria for a chronic post-traumatic headache. So anywhere between 8 to 58% of individuals. And even at three to four years post-injury, a large number of individuals will still have a change in their headache profiles. Interestingly enough, and this is really important in my line of work, headache severity and headaches in general are inversely uh, proportional to severity of head injury. So I see individuals who have severe traumatic brain injury who are in the ICU, you know, they're six, six months, three months post-injury, they, they don't have any headaches. Um, and so many, I would say the majority of the mild traumatic brain injury or concussion patients will have some type of head headache phenotype. And it's, you know, studies have shown over and over again that post-traumatic headache is more dis uh, disabling than uh, many of the primary headaches. So what are some of the risk factors for post-traumatic headaches? Um, so this is a, a nice systematic review that was just recently published in 2023. So headache at the time of injury, particularly um, the sport-related uh, concussion. Oh, I just lost my... Oh particularly the sport-related concussion, they've shown that individuals who have a headache immediately in the emergency department or within three hours of injury, that's uh, a predictor of going on to, to developing post-traumatic headache acutely as well as chronically. Female sex, pre-existing conditions, so pre-existing migraine headaches or a headache phenotype, uh, blast mechanisms, um, multiple mild traumatic brain injuries, so if this isn't their first concussion or mild TBI, if they have associated post-traumatic stress disorder, depression. Um, interestingly enough, and we'll get into this in terms of the different phenotypes of headaches, if there's uh, migraineous features to their headache, insomnia, so they have difficulty sleeping, dizziness, older age, and then somatic pain that can be associated with. And I won't touch on that this, um, in this talk, but there is uh, quite a bit of overlap when we talk about somatic symptom disorder and persistent symptoms following concussion. Okay, so, you know, can I, 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 I'll just look at this screen. Is that, how's that, is that okay? Um, so when I treat an individual with chronic post-traumatic headache, I really, I treat the whole person. It's not just the headache, and I, I think of, of all the, the primary symptoms that go along with concussion. And if I holistically treat the patient, not just the chronic post-traumatic headache, the patients do better. 
So these are the things I think about when I'm treating a patient with persistent post-concussion symptoms. Um, and many of them, headache is their primary uh, difficulty or primary symptom, but I holistically treat all their symptoms. So th things such as fatigue, um, obviously headaches. So exercise intolerance is very common after a concussion. Uh, increased emotionality, mood difficulties, anxiety, uh, sometimes PTSD or PTSI, vision difficulties, so vestibular ocular reflex dysfunction, cognitive difficulties, cognitive fog, dizziness, um, and insomnia or post-traumatic sleep disorders. So when I see someone with post-traumatic headache, these are some, um, but most of all the symptoms that I try to address when I see them. Uh, it's really hard to see. Oh, here. Uh, <laughs> yay! Uh, so this was a really nice paper that looked at post-traumatic headache and the comorbidities that are involved. So those individuals uh, with persistent, so chronic post-traumatic headache, often have poor sleep quality, high anxiety, low mood. They meet criteria for mild cognitive impairment, um, and some of them also have post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a nice schematic from the Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation um, Living Guidelines. And it's one of the, when we think about post-traumatic headache following concussion, it's one of the uh, guidelines that are uh, best available for us. I can't see that. Oh, there it goes back now. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we are, we are currently um, re-evaluating these, these guidelines um, as an expert panel. Uh, I will go through these right now because this is, the current, um, current guidelines available. And uh, as I go through my talk, I'll encourage you to, to rethink these guidelines in, in a different way. So uh, initially, we think about doing a focused headache history, um, thinking about the different types of headaches that were so fantastically described here already today, um, how disabling the headache is and uh, medication use, um, as well as performing a detailed neurological and musculoskeletal examination, which I will also touch on a bit later. Um, specifically, then, the guidelines go in and they talk about pharmacological management as well as non-pharmacological management, which was a really nice question that was already asked today in terms of exercise, physiotherapy, mindfulness, um, neurofeedback, massage, etc. Um, and when these guidelines were made, they were actually divided into tension type or unclassified headaches and migrainous headaches. Um, but I'm going to encourage you to think about this in a bit of a different way. And as I said before, really the non-pharmacological treatment is really important as well when we think about treating post-traumatic headaches, as well as treating holistically all the symptoms that the patient is presenting with. So this is kind of how I think I'd like you to think about post-traumatic headache. There's so many different types of headaches that can occur following a concussion or mild traumatic brain injury because there's a variety of different mechanisms in terms of how these, this can occur. Motor vehicle collisions, falls, um, assaults, sports. Uh, a head injury can occur in a variety of different ways and we really need to be thinking about the different types of headaches that can occur. So when we think so when we think about tension headaches, so the literature is somewhat vague, and I think this is a higher number than it actually is, but 75 to 97 percent of post-traumatic headaches are tension in, in nature, but some of this is older literature, and when they describe tension headaches, they also uh, rolled in cervicogenic headaches. 47 of the uh, headaches will meet criteria for migrainous type headaches. Occipital, or sorry, medication overuse is quite prominent. And we really don't know because, as I said before, a lot of the older literature ruled in tension and cervicogenic headaches. If we don't know the actual uh, number of individuals who will have a cervicogenic headache, um, as well as occipital neuralgia. And then there's other reasons. And doing a really good physical examination is important. So things such as vision, TMJ joint, are other really important things to think about. So really important when you're treating post-traumatic headache Usually, it's more than one headache type. So you're treating multiple different headaches um, when you're seeing these individuals, and they, they can be quite complicated. So this was already talked about today, so I'll just briefly touch on it. But this is one of the more common types of headaches that occur in post-traumatic headaches, and that's cervicogenic headaches. 
Um, specifically, this is the ICHD3 diagnostic criteria for cervical genetics, which was also already discussed today, but really important to delineate that, you know, the headache is, is triggered or coming from the neck. Um, and this is important to actually, when you're seeing a, a patient, not just to do a neurological examination, but also to do uh, a musculoskeletal examination as well. So we already also talked about the pathophysiology, but it's stemming um, from the trigeminal or the TCC or the trigeminal um, uh, uh, <laughs> trigeminal cervical nuclei, and then having the inputs from C1 and C2, um, as well as the occipital nerves as well, kind of coalescing on the upper cervical spine that can then go on um, to cause a cervicogenic headache. So I love this picture, and this is a little bit different um, in terms of what was already presented. But as you can see here, there's a referred pain pattern to a lot of these cervicogenic headaches. So again here, this was uh, an older paper from Lancet from, done by Bogdug, but I, I really like this, this uh, depiction of cervicogenic headaches. So if an individual has um, dysfunction at one of the, the levels, so C1, C2, you can see the referred pattern often can be in uh, the forehead, temporal region, behind the eye, um, and then going down the spine, that referred pain becomes more on the top of the head, the side of the head, and the back of the head. So these individuals that are presenting with a pain, they say, oh, my headache's right here, the headache's behind my eye, eyes, you need to be also thinking about upper cervical spine dysfunction because it's really important to rule that out. So when we're thinking about how to diagnose a cervicogenic headache, doing a really good detailed physical examination can be quite helpful. This is on top of taking a history. Um, so they will have impairment of muscle function, so flexion extension. They can have painful joint dysfunction and very importantly, restricted neck motion. So there was a very nice paper um, which was uh, published in 2021, and it was a validation of clinical examinations to rule in and rule out cervicogenic sources of headache. And it looked at these four different physical exam maneuvers. And if you scored two, if you had two out of four of these physical exam maneuvers that were positive, then you would uh, have a high specificity and sensitivity for a cervicogenic headache. So first, looking at cervical range of motion, so that people would have limited extension, so have difficulty looking up and back. The cranial cervical flexion test, which I'll just show you a picture of. Um, symptomatic joint dysfunction, so pain to palpation at different at the specific joints, as well as the flexion rotation test, which I'll also show you a picture. So this is the, this is the cranial cervical flexion test, which I, due to time purposes I won't dive into. Um, it does require a, a blood pressure cuff, and it really is trying to delineate whether the deep flexor muscles are weak and contri contributing towards the uh, uh, neck pain. Also, the cervical flexion rotation test, which is quite easy to do at the bedside and easy to, to be, make part of your physical exam, but it's actually lying the patient supine and bringing their head up and then getting them to end point and flexing and rotating their neck. And so that, along with palpation as well as just pa um, active range of motion, are four tests that you can do to actually help um, diagnose cervicogenic headaches. So again, I won't dive into this, but uh, already discussed, there's a multiple in, um, investigations that you can do to delineate whether a patient has cervicogenic headache. And there's multiple treatments. And you know, uh, importantly, um, things that weren't already dis discussed today that we are using in clinical practice, so it's PRP or plat platelet-rich plasma is actually a very use useful cornerstone of treatment that we're now using for individuals with cervicogenic headaches. Um, and actually, Ashley Smith and I are currently doing um, a randomized control trial, um, adjuncting physiotherapy with neuromodulation for cervicogenic headaches. So other things to think of when you're seeing these patients with post-traumatic headache is occipital neuralgia, um, and Dr. Jarvis dove into this quite nicely, and so I won't, I won't um, uh, 
discuss this in depth, but a lot of these patients have occipital neuralgia on top of other um, types of headaches. And it's, as Dr. Jarvis discussed, it, it, it's very rewarding to treat. Um, things to think about when you see these patients, if they're an athlete that was wearing a helmet, very, very common that you have a compression of the occipital nerve. Um, if the individual is involved in a motor vehicle collision, think about the mechanism of injury. High speed, low speed, lots of people are rear-ended. Their head is whiplash back and forth and their head is hit on the headrest. Also compression of the occipital nerve. So really important to palpate the back of their heads when you're doing a physical examination and ask them the radiation and where the pain is coming from. Uh, again, very rewarding as an adjunct treatment. Um, so this is also what Dr. Jarvis uh, dove into, so I won't discuss here. Um, but I, you know, there's been some interesting um, studies we, uh, on treatments for occipital neuralgia. You know, many individuals still do local steroid injections. Um, I don't. I, I do exactly what Dr. Jarvis does in terms of using um, anesthetics for injections. Um, there are individuals who do botulism toxins, and the studies aren't great on using botulism toxins for greater occipital or lesser occipital neuralgia. Um, but more, we just finished a study looking at platelet-rich plasma as a, um, a, another a type of injection that is safe, um, and it is showing promise as one that would could provide longevity of pain relief um, and would be a safe injection. Um, <laughs> that's okay. So in terms of um, post-traumatic migraineous headaches, again, because post-traumatic headaches are, has, have not, as Dr. Becker has described, been studied specifically in and of itself as an entity in depth, we extrapolate from primary headaches. Um, same here for migraine headaches. We use the criteria for treating to treat post-traumatic migraineous headaches, and we use um, the same clinical <laughs> treatments and pathways that are used for primary uh, chronic uh, migraine headaches to treat uh, post-traumatic headaches with migraineous features. Um, so as you can see here, if a patient meets criteria for migraines, we would consider them having post-traumatic migraine headaches. And there's a variety of different interventions um, that we would use, very similar to uh, migraine headaches. Um, and it's important to note here that just because it works in migraine headaches doesn't mean it's going to work in post-traumatic migraine headaches. And you know, my my group, my research group, and other research groups um, are are looking at the pathophysiology and biology that is unique to post-traumatic migraine headaches. Because the, there is, and what we're finding is that the underlying biology and pathophysiology of post-traumatic migraine headaches is different than primary migraine headaches. And so oh, all these years we've been using the same paradigms and the same treatments for primary migraine headaches, but maybe they're different. And I think as a field we're finding that they are, so stay tuned. <laughs> but as, as, as it stands right now, if you do see someone with a post-traumatic Headache with migraine as features that meet the criteria for migraine, those are the tools that you'll be using. So I'll go back to the guidelines here that are used from the Ontario Neurotrauma Living Guidelines. Um, and they do discuss migraine as headaches in terms of what can be useful and what cannot be useful. And as you can see here, they, they really recommend similar guidelines to what's used for um, what Dr. Amuzagar just discussed, as well as for the chronic migraine headache phenotype. So what I'd like you to take home here is that treating post-traumatic headaches, you holistically want to look at the patient you want to treat the headache, but you want to be treating the other symptoms that are involved. You want to be thinking about the variety of different phenotypes that can occur with post-traumatic headache. You want to think that, yes, they have this primary post-traumatic headache phenotype, 
but they most likely have others and is often mixed. And that's kind of what makes them more complicated, but that's also what makes them, these patients, more rewarding to treat. Um, and you also have to kind of think outside the box that it might be something else. So other things to think about is obviously tension headaches. So trigger point injections is a mainstay for um, tension headaches as well as manual therapy. Um, and massage therapy can be also helpful. Interestingly, specifically for tension headaches, topicals can sometimes be helpful as well. Um, whereas Botox injections that has not been shown to be helpful. And there ha was a, a good randomized control trial showing that Botox injections was not helpful for tension headaches. Um, other things to think about, because these are concussion patients, you have to be thinking about the vision the visual oc uh, ocular reflex dysfunction and vision dysfunction. So if you think about it, and this is how I describe it to my patients, I wear glasses, but if you told me to take off my glasses and try to read that print, eventually I would get a headache, right? And so that's what we're asking these patients to do. Their vestibular ocular reflex is not working well. And so they're trying to delineate what's going on in their world and they're squinting and they're using overusing their brain and it's it's contributing towards headaches so definitely something to think about in this patient population oh. <laughs> uh, obviously medication overuse headaches which was nicely touched on by dr muzagar um, and that's it 